Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Literacy View. We have a very special guest with us today. We have Dr. Nathan Clemens, and he and Sharon Vaughn wrote an article for the Reading League Journal entitled Misunderstandings of the Science of Reading. And I thought it was a fabulous article. And I think you're going to find this um, episode enlightening because there are misunderstandings, just like there are misunderstandings about um, other elements of reading instruction, writing instruction. When we talk about the science, we want to clarify um, you know, what's important, what we need to know, and what um, you know, we don't need to know. Mm -hmm. So let me introduce our guest. And um, Dr. Nathan Clemens is professor and department chair of, of special education at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Clemens research and teaching focuses on improving instruction and intervention for students with reading difficulties or dyslexia in preschool through adolescence. More specifically, his work is aimed at improving teachers use of assessment data to better understand their students' progress and to help them align and individualize evidence-based interventions with their students' unique learning needs in order to promote stronger outcomes. So we don't have Sharon Vaughn with us tonight, unfortunately, um, but um, she obviously has a huge, huge following um, in this science of reading world and how wonderful that you were able to team up with her. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I know that you're going to enlighten us and give us the information we need. So let's get started. Um, in the opening paragraph, Nathan, um, it was written, movements like what has occurred, which would be science of reading, um, with the science of reading can result in a belief that a consensus exists on what constitutes effective reading instruction and any skepticism or questions to the contrary are discouraged. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think that some people coming out of the balanced literacy world feel kind of shut down sometimes when they have these questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think healthy skepticism is important. Could you talk about why perhaps that was the opening um, when you wrote this article that um, were you thinking that maybe there is this, um, you know, misunderstanding on both sides that need to be clarified? Yeah, thank you. First of all, thanks for having me on the podcast. It's really good to be here. And um, I'm sorry, sorry, Sharon can't make it. She's on sabbatical this semester and um, is uh, uh, using this time really wisely for for her. So <laughs> uh, she wishes she could be here, but um, but uh, you have the the second string here tonight. So <laughs> well, you know, I just want to stop you right there. You are just as important, and we are <laughs> thrilled to have you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. You're our that. number one tonight. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, so about that that point, um, you know, that's really, you know, Faith, you really kind of hit it, was that, um, you know, we we led with that because, as you know, how how polarizing the field of reading and reading instruction has been for so long. Um, you know, we're constantly referring to pendulum swings and things going back and forth. Um, the uh, obviously, Sharon and I come from the perspective of what people view as the science of reading. Uh, we contribute to the science of reading. Sharon, and Sharon especially, has been uh, a primary contributed contributor to what we know of as the science of reading. Um, but when a movement like that takes hold. Uh, and um, is so remarkable, I think, in its scope and its sweep and how how uh, quickly it can spread across practice circles and into legislation. Um, 
I, I think there's a tendency for things to go a little wildly out of control. And when, um, when individuals tend to grasp onto uh, a movement like this or become caught up in it, uh, there sometimes is that tendency to have perceptions around in-group effects, around notions that, you know, we want only, only, only want to take in information that conforms to the way we want to see the world. Um, and any, any debate or any contrary evidence is viewed as um, invalid, is viewed as um, only argumentative. And we tend to dismiss things that, that may not, you know, fit the way we want to see the world. And that's really us as human beings, you know, we have that confirmation bias that is constantly working within us in many, many situations. What's so um, tricky about interpreting research and the scientific evidence base is that, you know, it's really essential to do, to as much as possible, look at it from a sort of a cold, hard viewpoint. What does the evidence say? And critiquing all evidence, regardless of what it's saying, um, even evidence that conforms to our belief, we have to apply the same type of criticism and critique to it as, as well. Um, and we're all, you know, we're all human and we all sort of want to root for things. You know, we all want to, we want things to work out in the way in which we, we hope they do. Um, but from a, certainly from a standpoint of interpreting evidence, it's, it's so important to look at it as, as much as we can from an objective standpoint. Um, we raise the point, and I'm not sure if we do in this paper, but something I say a lot in a lot of my talks is that, you know, understanding the science of reading is, is understanding what the evidence says, but also what it doesn't say. Um, and that being part of a scientific community is about recognizing what is known but also acknowledging that there's usually as many unanswered questions as there are answered ones. And like so many, so many aspects of reading development and reading instruction, there are many things we don't know yet, many things in which studies are equivocal. You know, some studies support a practice, others don't. In other cases where simply studies haven't been done to explore a particular question. And so that's really our, our way of, you know, we started off the, the paper that way to kind of lay the groundwork on establishing a sense of caution, we hope, um, and balance in thinking about this debate. You did. You absolutely did. And what a thorough answer you gave. So Judy, Judy, Judy. So, <laughs> um, so uh, you read the article like I did. Let's start with the first point, because we talk about this all the time. And the first point was, does the science of reading refer to a program or specific pedagogy? And in the article, it was very clear that it shouldn't be about program, you know. Uh, and so... What did you get out of point one, Judy, when you read this? First of all, I have to say, Nathan, this article was such a pleasure to read. Sometimes Faithful sent me some of the articles and I'm like, oh no, this is a study. It's going to be a long study. Let me read the beginning. Let me read the end. But yours was, I love the format that you wrote it. And I love like me the too. Q and A format. And I think as somebody who's still in the field, as you see, I'm wearing school merchandise. I'm still a teacher literacy coach and so forth, it really spoke to me. And I found it like to be the juici juiciest questions on my mind. And I loved seeing your answers and so forth. So in terms of the first one, that one really hit home. And I'm going to give an example of why it really hit home. I'm going to read a little bit from something that I'm not going to name the publisher, but I'm going to read a, a nice one that I called Faith about the other day or texted her. Okay, so this is a kindergarten assessment. And it's a listening skill. It's called Miss Cat and Mr. Fox. Miss Cat moved quickly to get home. She had heard that mean Mr. Bear was in town. At home, Miss Cat sat down to think of a plan. Mr. Bird landed next to Miss Cat. You are so safe up in that tree, Mr. Bird said. Miss Cat, what a perfect hiding place. It goes on and on and on and on. This is a kindergarten passage 
that kids are supposed to listen to. The directions don't say how many times they listen. There's no picture support. We have many kids in our school that don't have English as their first language. And this is an assessment to, uh, to measure their knowledge and skills and standards. And I'm like, holy shit. This is a kindergarten assessment. And I literally have this document that I was looking at because I wanted to unpack it with my staff. And here are some of my notes. Okay, so this is reviewing traits. Uh, bear is so mean. Cat found Mr. Burt. L literally, I have so many notes on it that I could barely keep track of it. And then what's funny is, so I really respect Faith and she is my comprehension queen. And she was like, holy cow, oh, there's a lot going on in that doozy. Then Faith continues to show this wonderful thriller to her husband, who's an attorney, to see his stance. Faith, what did your hubby say after he listened, uh, read this doozy? Faith, you're muted. Faith, you're muted. He couldn't follow it either. Okay, so an attorney, how many years has he been an attorney? <laughs> many years. So, you know, my point being, and I don't want to be long, but my point is that just because a program says it's an evidence-based program, yes, it may have some pedagogical moves that it does in there and some met methods of teaching kids how to read that may align with the science of reading. However, there's no way that all these programs, evidence-based every task, every um, pa reading passage, I am a firm believer that pedagogy is key. I feel firmly that teacher knowledge is key on how to teach kids how to read. I've invested eight years of my life um, following my balanced literacy days. I don't know, Nathan, if you know, I used to be a reading recovery teacher. My specialty was balanced literacy. I was behind that class and I had to shift my mindset because I knew that the research and evidence was saying to do something differently. However, there's no way in hell that I'm going to buy that every program right now that claims to be aligned with the science, that everything is aligned with the best practices and research. And that passage really uh, shows me that there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think that pedagogy is key. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not familiar with that assessment, but I, so I can't comment on it, but I think it's, you know, what you're saying is indicative of a lot of things. I think the the term evidence based is thrown around too loosely, um, way too loosely, and especially by by publishers and program developers. I think uh, anytime that educators see that term, anytime <clears throat> schools are considering adopting a new program and something is claiming to be evidence based, press the publishers on what does that evidence look like? Where can I find it? Um, you know, what can you give me the studies that, um, that indicate the evidence? Um, you know, and, and there are actually very in the body of research that we refer to as the science of reading, there are relatively few studies that focused on specific branded programs. Um, much more research has been conducted on elements of instruction on types of practices on approaches to to reading instruction or approaches to providing reading practice for students um, the extent to and this is much more difficult to ascertain because now you have to see do the elements of this particular program align with what we know about elements that appear to have some evidence of of success in improving literacy outcomes um, and I think part of the um, that first point we're making is that many schools are now starting to say that, you know, we're a science of reading district or we've adopted the science of reading um, as if, you know, as if it is something you can just, you know, do and adopt. And it's not, a, it's not a package program. You know, again, the science of reading is really a collection of, it's really an, a, a knowledge base um, that is, the result of decades of research. Um, but within that knowledge base is again, going back to what I said earlier is um, a lot of unanswered questions. We have some indications. We have evidence that points to, in some directions of things we should be doing more of, um, but it also doesn't say, and also doesn't establish what we should be doing all the time. 
Uh, Can I ask Nathan something, Faith, just quickly? Nathan, absolutely. so what if me, as myself, as an educator still in the field, I come across something like that, and, you know, we're told as educators you need to follow something with fidelity. Now the new word also is integrity. Mm -hmm. What do I do if, based on my knowledge, I don't know if it aligns with what I think is best for students like do i just go with it and see how it goes what do i do <laughs> that's such a good question because um so many of these programs um are comprehensive and that's a kind word i'm using comprehensive a lot of it's kind of garbage stuff that's filler but how is the teacher supposed to separate what is really um quality um, and, and what's just kind of thrown in and put together as this label, SOR label. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Uh, I'll give you some thoughts about it. Um, I, I would obviously in, in everything I'm saying um, for your listeners to, you know, please, you know, evaluate what I'm saying, think about how it fits your context, and obviously don't do something that um, is going to get you into trouble with your with your supervisors. Um, but, uh, you know, I think this idea, like, first of all, being asked to do something with fidelity and integrity, uh, I think there's obviously value in doing that. But I think in, in being asked to do something with fidelity, with integrity, asking, okay, what do you mean by that? Like, what what do you call being showing fidelity to the program? To what extent do I have any flexibility in how I'm implementing a program? Um, some might be more rigid and expecting, you know, 90% uh, follow through with these particular steps. Others might have here are the key components that, you know, if you're doing these key components, you're doing the program, you have some flexibility with the others. There, there might be some definition differences in terms of fidelity and, and implementation integrity from program to program. I think other times though, in which you, um, you're just not sure, like uh, you're given something that you're asked to do, you're reviewing it. Um, you're not quite sure if the evidence is there. You're, you're, you, you don't know. Okay. And you don't have time to look things up. Right. Um, I think you can look for some key things that that I think are where the evidence points that you can view as important. For one, does the program or practice or whatever it is you're trying you're being asked to do, does it involve having kids read and spell words and read text? Um, obviously, there's going to be other important things to do for kids in learning to read, but above all, does it involve abundant practice? in them reading words, spelling words, and reading text with your support as a teacher. Are you there listening to them read um, and providing them feedback on when they're reading words correctly? And when they're not reading words correctly, providing immediate error correction and showing them what to do differently. You're um, getting a big cheers, Nate. <laughs> Just yeah, Faith, I've been waiting for that button. I know she's up. been holding this button up, Nathan, as you're talking. <laughs> we have to give you a cheer. All right, so let's do one. Go. A double cheers. Let's go, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Oh, thank you. Um, and, and I think you know some people might say, well, yeah, duh. But I mean, if you if you look at what has what can happen sometimes in, in classrooms, and there's actually some studies like this. Uh, Sean Kent, for example, and, um, and Jeannie Wanzek, uh, Stephanie Alatebo were involved in some of this work, where they did some observations of um, kindergarten classrooms, and they measured the amount of time that students spent looking at print. And they had a series of observations over a number of days and, and weeks, and just, just measured the amount of time kids were engaged with print. Um, the overall averages were so small that they had to summarize it in terms of seconds per day. Um, most of what ha can happen sometimes is just so much other things, so many other activities or uh, teachers talking or students listening. Um, there's obviously, there's a very important things that can be gained through listening, listening comprehension, vocabulary. I'm not saying don't do those things, but above all, 
kids should read every day. Um, they should read with support and they should read with um, feedback on how they're doing. So that's the first thing is reading, reading and spelling, reading text every day. The second is that um, this program, if it's aimed at developing students' skills in reading words and spelling words accurately, it should provide direct instruction in how to do those things. Um, the, the instruction should be clear. Um, it should be explicit. It should show kids how to learn the alphabetic code, how to link letters and letter combinations with sounds, and then how to use that information to read and spell words. Um, it doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be, the entire time that program is implemented, right? But at least some element of it is involving direct instruction in how to use, learn the alphabetic code and how to use it. And that's of course important if students are at that stage of acquiring reading skills. Um, so I can, I can go on with perhaps a, a couple others, but I think first and foremost, look for the fundamental things that kids need to learn to become readers is that's experience and opportunities to read and places for you to, as teachers to provide them support and guidance and feedback in doing it. And you're giving them instruction in how to use the alphabetic code and um, and in in that in the, in those ways of learning to read and spell. Thank you. Um, and also opportunities to write, I'm sure, would mm -hmm. be just as important. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And so those opportunities to read text every day. Um, now you have an opportunity to talk about um, the words being used in the text to learn new vocabulary that applies to the text they're reading. And then after reading, you're talking about what happened, you're making inferences, you're drawing connections, kids can summarize, they can identify main idea, and then they can write about what they've read. Um, and so um, tying those elements together in ways in which, you know, you can integrate these notions around big important elements of instruction within the same practice, within the same opportunities and not siloed and scattered across a lesson or a day. Yeah, I, I think that we've had this conversation, Judy and I have had people on um, where we, we talked about this as well, this integration of reading mm -hmm. and writing. Mm -hmm. So um, Nathan, next point. Um, let's talk about four and five. So number four was, has the science of reading established that there is only one effective way to teach reading? And the other one, number five, was does the science of reading show that most reading instruction should be focused on phonics? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know that phonics was a big push for many, many years because it was left out, right? But according to your article, it seems like there could be an overstep with phonics where other elements of reading have been left out. Mm -hmm. And then this point with number four was, um, is there only one effective way of teaching reading? And people often um, want their view to be the right view, mm -hmm. you know, the one view. And so could you maybe elaborate on both of these points a little bit? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, potential oversteps and that's <clears throat> one of the things that prompted that, um, that point and the comments that we had been seeing in, in some cases anecdotally um, was this idea that, um, you know, when, when individuals recognized the importance of phonics instruction and perhaps recognized that it hadn't been being implemented at levels in which it should have been in the past, um, we're going to do much more of it, I think. Um, and as the science of reading conversations continue and there's more and more advocacy for, for phonics instruction, which is absolutely a good thing, um, but I think there's a worry on our part that as um, publishers, program developers pick up on this, and when they see these kinds of things being codified into legislation, now they start to think that this is what the market wants. 
that these are the market drivers. And so we're going to give them programs in which phonics is 75% of what you're doing across the day. Um, and that's, I, I think, obviously, I think that would be an own overstep. And especially if you're doing that unequivocally across grade levels. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think we have to think, we have to be careful not to just um, overdo things. I think there's times in which um, if, if you are teachers who are perhaps coming from a whole language perspective, from a workshop model type of perspective, you are bringing immense knowledge and value about engaging students with authentic literature, which we think is incredibly important. That's going to speak to another one that hopefully we can get to. Um, where you need to, perhaps to adjust and adjust and maybe initially in just some subtle ways is starting to bring in more explicit instruction in letter sound correspondence, again, decoding, spelling words. Um, it doesn't have to be most of the reading lesson. In fact, it probably shouldn't be. There really isn't evidence right now indicating how much phonics instruction kids need. Um, there's, I, I think, convincing evidence to say that most students need at least some level of explicit phonics instruction but it's going to vary based on their level of reading acquisition and reading development. Um, and, um, you know, and I think it's dependent on a lot of individual differences in, in the classroom. There will have to be some instructional differentiation that teachers will have to do. There'll be some children in the classroom in which more explicit instruction is going to be needed more often and other students who are right along the, you know, there are much further ahead potentially in terms of their reading skills. And for them, you know, a, the same level of explicit phonics instruction won't be needed. Um, so I, I think it's it's about thinking carefully about this and not, not going too far in, in terms of one direction and bringing in too much phonics instruction. I think that is also on <clears throat> program publishers and curriculum developers to, um, you know, be, be cognizant of, of those kinds of things. The science of reading is not saying that we need to be doing phonics instruction all day. Obviously, that would be detrimental and problematic because what would get cut out, right? We, we lose time for vocabulary instruction, for knowledge and for building background knowledge. Um, you know, other elements of writing, certainly you can work writing in with phonics instruction around spelling, but um, writing about what you're reading could, could get sacrificed if we're doing too much phonics instruction all across the day. Um, I think, in, in, um, oh, sorry, one more, one more quick point, because you asked me about um, uh, no, one, no one way to teach reading. <clears throat> and I think that's another element that's um, sometimes uh, lost in the science of reading conversation is that um, the only way is through, um, you know, X approach. Um, and I think, again, we have indications that, you know, instruction should involve a lot of students reading. It should involve um, at least some degree of explicit phonics instruction it's in, in some way in the student's educational career. Um, but how that's accomplished is not quite clear. Um, and there's lots of different ways of, of getting to that place of building skilled readers. Um, if you're doing explicit instruction in the alphabetic code, to, to an extent, you're providing lots of opportunities to read you can get there and there's probably a lot of different variation in what happens in, in the actual implementation of those practices. So Judy, listening to um, Nathan and as I'm listening, my eyes are going to number six. And we talked about this quite a bit. Number six was does the science of reading say that pictures should never be used in reading instruction? Do you remember we had an episode with Missy Purcell about this? I mean, and where there were people on Twitter talking about how science of reading um, will say, no, you have to take picture books away from kids. Can't remember her. Oh, Nancy. Um, what's her name? Do you remember the last name? Bailey. Nancy Bailey. That's right. Nancy Bailey. And she wrote an article about this, that people, proponents of science of reading 
want to take picture books away from kids. So that gets a big BS. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> Judy, talk a little bit about that in terms of what you are doing as a coach. Um, do people in K-1 and 2 think that we're taking away picture books from kids because it's science of reading, that that's something that's part of it? Are there misunderstandings? Do you hear that? All right. So just let me just also for one second touch on what nathan said about um different approaches to reading and then i'll get to that one faith i think that this whole show the literacy view has helped me in my own personal journey to move away from being overly attached to programs like you know i no longer see myself as oh i'm a foundations person or oh i'm a paf preventing academic failure person, or, oh, I'm an OG person, or, oh, I've shifted a little bit. And I think that that's a very important message that I want to get clear to everybody. Very often, these theories are based in the same theory, right? Some of them. Uh, sounds right and all those might be a little bit different. I think that the goal is always getting kids to read. And there's no, you know, there's, there's multiple different programs that, if done, well can get kids to read effectively so i don't take it as personally anymore when somebody tells me oh i'm not a foundations person that's fine but are we getting the results that we want with kids reading i think that's what's really important to look at i think it's really important to look at the pedagogy the knowledge and also another thing that we can't take away is also looking at our data and what are the outcomes that are being produced in our classrooms. I think that's a really big one that's really important. I think, you know, like recently a coworker of mine or somewhere in the field, somebody said, this isn't working. And I, and I wasn't brave at the moment to say, how do you know it's not working? Have you ever implemented the program? Are you collecting the data? have you seen the data so i think those are the kind of questions that we should be very focused on when people just say things aren't working i think very often people will sometimes say those kind of things motivated by what they're attached to or what they like or what they've been trained in and i'm keeping a very open mind my journey is not over i'm going to be trained in additional things i'm open to a lot of things so that's one point mm -hmm. but going back to what faith just mentions in terms of pictures absolutely rubbish that science of reading people think that pictures aren't um useful in many ways look at our read alouds we always talk about the pictures we always talk about stories and comprehension and so forth look at foundations a program like foundations there's a letter there's a keyword there's a sound there is a picture i think the misinterpretation comes in the sense that for a very long time in the balanced literacy days what we were doing as the first course of action is we were paying so much attention to meaning as the first course of action, and we were totally not shifting kids' eyes towards visual print, meaning the words and the letters. As long as we're intentional of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and when we're doing it, of course pictures are fine. And of course, um, you, you can have baskets that are picture book baskets where kids can have oral language discussions and so forth. But yes, when we're first teaching kids how to crack the code and learn how to read, it's very important to shift our eyes towards the visual print. Does that mean we're not going to tell stories like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and look at the pictures I'm of Snow White? And a big cheers because- Wow, right. a lucky day. Yeah. You really gave quite an answer there, my Judy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that, that was great. And I, I don't know if I could even, I don't think I can say, I, I, no, I can't say it any better because the way that you phrased it is exactly why we wrote our response. And, that, um, you know, I, I think it's sad that there's this idea that um, this misinterpretation that the evidence says to get rid of pictures because it absolutely doesn't say that. Um, you're right in that um, our, what we should be doing is <clears throat> teaching the alphabetic code, teaching kids to trust the code, teaching them to decode the word as best as they can using their knowledge of letter sound correspondence. 
But after they've read words, after they've read a sentence, then, you know, referring to the picture, I think, is great because it can help confirm pronunciation. You know, a lot of what we do as skilled readers, we get implicit feedback because we, we know we understand what's happening. We know we read the words correctly because things make, are making sense. For a developing reader, doesn't have that vicarious reinforcement yet because their skills are still developing. But if they get this other source of information um, in terms of the illustration, and when the, you know, when a skilled reader or a teacher or a caregiver is there to expand on that even more, now it's adding further confirmation, and understanding, and you're expanding their knowledge and their understanding even even more. Uh, photos, pictures, illustrations add interest. Um, I would even suggest, and, um, you know, I think there would be need to be, um, certainly there would need to be studies around this, but the idea that's emerging, you know, more frequently these days around set for variability, the kid's ability to adjust an approximate pronunciation to be correct. When they've partially decoded a word or they've decoded a word and it's, they've sounded it out and it's not quite right, um, using other information like illustrations potentially can help them understand how they should adjust that word to match a word in their oral vocabulary that fits the context. Um, so again, it's not about, you know, we want to get away from this idea of using pictures as the first prompt, as the first cue in word guessing, right? We don't want to prompt please, guessing. Please, please, Nathan, I'm sorry. I like yeah. you. You're a great guy, but I got to give you a cheers. I can't help it. <laughs> Thank you. Can you say that again, Nathan? Can you say the point that you said again before we do a cheers? Please say it again. The very, uh, very last part. The uh, we want to get we want to we don't want to prompt kids to guess. You know, we don't want we want them to use their knowledge of the alphabetic code to um, to decode words, but then obviously using their knowledge, their knowledge of semantics, background knowledge, vocabulary to backfill to feed in and to, to help them recognize when they've read words correctly and confirm pronunciation and add interest to what they've read um that you know, was perfect that was perfect judy cheers to that answer <laughs> and Nathan is spot on and that's the biggest thing that's bothering me that people somehow think that you know it was the whole msv thing right msv the miss q analysis thing mm -hmm. and um Nobody was saying that meaning wasn't important. We all know that the ultimate goal of reading is always to understand. However, we were going in so heavy with a meaning support. I mean, myself included, Faith, you would be very mad at me. You would go into my leveled library, which I haven't thrown out. It's repurposed mm -hmm. for the kids that broke the code. And in every single book, I wrote these very, very supportive book introductions. Why? because I was so scared that the kid wouldn't be able to read the book if I didn't go so heavy on supporting meaning. Mm -hmm. And there were so many word patterns, especially in the beginner readers, level A, B, C, and D, there was multisyllabic words. There was these words that were word patterns that the kids never learned. And you know, my wake up call was when I was working with ENL students that didn't really have the English language experience that a lot of other kids had. So now they were given a multisyllabic word, whereas in their scope and sequence, they were learning CVC words. So how were they getting those words? They were looking at the first letter and, and praying to whoever that they would get the word right. Mm -hmm. And then they were looking at the picture. So let's, so let's go with number nine, because since you both kind of went into the leveled books, mm -hmm. number nine is, does the science of reading say that level text should never be used. Now, here's my two cents. The issue that I see is it's not so much the book itself, it's the leveling of children. Mm -hmm. And so when we look to label a child with a letter and this child is a level G, this child is a level you know, S reader, and we we keep them stuck in these levels that that's not what we should be doing the book is a book and some of the books are quite good mm -hmm. and if we use them well and we know um the purpose of why we're giving it to them and we know the type of reader we're giving it to they could be fine as judy said it's more 
you know, problematic with those earlier level books and teaching kids how to read words using those early level books. Right. But the rest of the books are just books. And so I want people to listen out there that when we want to, you know, put kids into these leveled groups and give them a letter that where we could be stunting their growth and, and not allowing them to read grade level text by keeping them in these low level books. And then there are kids at the upper end that could actually go higher. And that's what I remember reading, that there was a study done and there were kids in these upper levels that definitely had the potential and the capacity to do much better and read higher levels. Mm -hmm. So could you add a little bit um, Nathan, about how to use both decodable, because there was a question in here about decodable books, mm -hmm. um, and then level books, if you could clarify that. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, and so um, the perspective that Sharon and I were coming from in, in writing this paper, and particularly these two items, is that you know we believe in the value of of using decodables when appropriate and authentic text um, as well, and so um, I think first off I think you're exactly right and you hit the nail on the head, Faith, in terms of the the ideas around leveled readers and level literacy. We what prompted this that one was that we had seen anecdotal reports of of people being very proud of the fact that they're taking their level literacy sets out and throwing them in the dumpster, which um, made us quite sad um, because like you said, you know, it, the problem was this idea that we can use the levels as a prescription for what reading content kids should get or how we should teach. Um, the books themselves were never really the problem. The, and the books are often really, really good. Um, it's authentic text. You have in, in like a level liter literacy library, you tend to have books of so many different subjects and, um, and genres that you could use to apply to different things you might be teaching your content areas. Um, and so um, the idea really is don't get rid of the level text, continue to use it. It's a fantastic resource for reading practice. Um, it's great for supporting content liter literacy. I saw someone um, on X recently said, you know, instead of organizing by levels, take your level readers and organize them by subject matter. You have a, a bin for sports, you have a bin for biology, you have a bin for, um, for animals, um, you know, organized by content, by subject area. And now you have a place, another resource for providing text that's aligned with what you're teaching in, um, at a given time. Um, that authentic text, I think, is important. I think you, you still have to consider the student's reading level. Uh, it's not easy to know what type of text is going to be successful for a student and providing them with, with content for reading and instruction and reading for practice. Um, that is where your clinical judgment as a teacher is going to have to come in. Can this student read most of the words in this particular passage accurately? Um, if errors are too infrequent, um, then frustration is going to set in, then it's going to, the number of errors is going to be potentially too detrimental. But if we do have a, a pretty good sense of success, are we, are we seeing the student read nine out of every 10 words correctly. Um, and if you're there to provide support, you can push that difficulty level even further a bit. Um, Sharon has written about this idea of stretch text, like stretching students' um, skills, providing them text that's a little bit above their current reading level, giving them an opportunity to access more challenging words, more challenging and diverse syntax, um, different ideas around background knowledge, and if you're there for supporting, for pre-teaching key vocabulary, for providing um, corrective feedback as needed, then that stretch text can act in similar ways as when we increase weight or distance in our strength training, right? We gain, in, as we're exercising, we gain strength and stamina through increases in distance and increases in, in weight, uh, weight resistance. You can think about stretch text in those ways. Um, you're not doing it all the time, and you're doing it for small portions, and you're doing it with support, but um, that stretch text is perhaps providing that um, those key challenge moments. Um, 
But then also for students who are, you know, acquiring the code, who are at beginning stages of, of learning to read, then having text in which they can more quickly and readily apply their new skills in letter sound correspondence to text in which there's a good deal of regularity in the words that they're seeing, then those decodable texts can be very valuable as well. Um, I like to think about decodable text as uh, balance bikes, not bikes with training wheels, balance bikes. You're probably familiar with the, the bikes without pedals, you know, where kids kind of sit on them and they push along with their feet. And they, as they're playing with their, their balance bikes, they soon realize that they can push along and lift their feet up and start coasting. What they're doing now is they're balancing. They're starting to learn how to regulate their body posture, their, how they're balancing their weight, how they're using the steering to keep the bike upright. Um, they are going to be, and this is, you know, actually something that, that has been demonstrated that kids can transition from balance bikes to real bikes much faster than kids can from training wheels to real bikes. I love um, this analogy and I've <laughs> never heard it before. Ever, oh. ever. It's like, whoa, what an interesting analogy. Mm -hmm. Super. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, what is like training wheels. Um, when we give kids predictable text or when we're asking kids to guess based on pictures uh, or predictable text is probably a better one. So you're familiar with the predi predictable text. I see a cat. I see a dog. I see a zebra. I see an elephant. Um, you know, the, all, all the text is structured that way. Uh, you might see words that are in a different color. Uh, sometimes you'll see pictures replacing words. And kids learn the pattern, then they just start reciting the pattern, right? And they might be using other cues on the page, like the color of the word or other picture cues to guess. They're not really reading. It looks like they're reading, just like a kid on a, on a, on a bike with training wheels looks like they're riding, but really they're just wobbling back and forth on the, the two training wheels. Take the training wheels off, they fall over. Take the predictability away or take away the picture cues or the color cues, they're, they're not reading, right? So um, you know what? I have to stop you, Judy. Now I know for my grandson, when he gets to that point, no bike with training wheels, balance bikes. <laughs> it just works. You're hundred percent right. And Nathan, I did something recently. I mentioned it on another episode. Um, somebody very close to me sent me a video of somebody I love dearly reading a level text and you know, Loving mom, who I love and adore, was very proud. It was a proud mama moment. Look, look how great my son's reading. And like, I know those level texts. I've seen them a hundred times. So I asked this sweet, adoring, wonderful person, take those words off the page the next day and see how um, the child does when those words are on a page without the picture support and without mm. the patterns. So it was a predictable text, Judy? It was a predictable text? Um, yeah. No, this one oh. wasn't as predictable. Okay. It was a really leveled, complex beginner text, mm -hmm. and it wasn't as easy okay. at all. Gotcha. And the decoding was like a hot mess, and the picture support was gone. And, um, you know, and they got some words. I think it might have clicked in the child's head. Oh, wait, shit. I think that's the book about the bicycle again. But, yeah. you know, while you know, the child's living their best life, turning the pages, reading the level book. But then the other experience was like the hands biting the fingers, the yeah. body, the body language changes. And, uh, you know, I have to thank faith for that because years ago, I, I mean, people could go back to the literacy view. It might've been episode four or three. I was in a very different place on how I felt about this topic. So I think the most important thing is that you know, change is sometimes hard for people. And I know, you know, being in the field right now, a lot of teachers are thinking about small group instruction, right? Screener data is coming in. What does that look like? What kind of books am I going to use? Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of teachers are thinking, what is my classroom library going to look like? And I think, you know, Nathan covered so many important things, you know, to those teachers that think throwing out all those books is, is, um, the best decision. No, I didn't throw out my level text. Some of them are my juiciest 
stories that had great rich problems and solutions mm -hmm. and can be great for comprehension and could actually be quite great for kids that have basically almost cracked the code and mm -hmm. now they're being exposed to multiple things in my scope and sequence and if i'm giving them like you said nathan that corrective feedback mm -hmm. and i'm prompting them in a way that brings their attention to connect what they're learning in phonics it could be a great experience but i think sometimes it's a pull and push and pull you have to listen to those kids read to mm -hmm. see what they're doing in text and yeah. i think what nathan said is so important make sure the kids are reading uh oh you don't like something faith no nope. i want to stop you because you said that you want to thank me because earlier on you were different let's see when i bring up the next point if you're going to be loving me like you did before <laughs> so in the article um Nathan, you talked about syllable types and rules. Let me get to that. That was number 16. According to the science of reading, is it necessary for students to learn spelling and syllable division rules? So Judy and I have talked about this. Judy loves syllable types and, and that whole um, and rules. And I said, <laughs> let me finish, Judy. Let me finish. And I've said that I don't think it's a bad idea. I mean, I'm certified in Wilson and, and you know, I know that it can work, but it's not necessary. And that kids can be taught without syllable division rules mm -hmm. and, um, and, and spelling rules. And I usually talk about generalizations and flexibility. And I saw that that was something you mentioned in the article, Nathan. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of teachers out there that um, use programs like Foundations, Wilson, um, OG based programs where they have syllable types um, and they feel like that is the science of reading. And that's what I want to talk about with you mm -hmm. because they're using syllable types and perhaps rules doesn't mean that that is the science of reading. Could you clarify sure. some of that? Sure. Yeah, um, that's right. And it doesn't, so it doesn't necessarily mean they're doing the science of reading, but it also doesn't mean that they're doing the wrong thing either. I want to be correct. 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 Yep. That's exactly right. And I, I, I'm not, I don't mean to interrupt now, but I don't want to be um, thought of that I'm saying that either. And I even have said that to Judy too. It's not like it's a wrong thing, but there are other ways to teach. I got to chime in. I love syllable types, but it's not the only approach I use anymore, Faith. You know that, right? Yeah. So I got to talk about that too. And I'm not, I'll let Nathan talk because it's his turn. I'm going to be quiet. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I think um, it's one of those areas where there, there, you know, evidence is is unclear. I, I think <clears throat> there has been, um, you know, there's a, a long tradition of, of teaching syllable types, syllable, syllable division rules in reading instruction. Um, it doesn't. It often comes from a basis of perspective and opinion, and not so from an evidence based standpoint. Um, there are kids who learn to read proficiently in a program that isn't asking them to memorize um, syllable division types and rules, but there are also kids that, that learn to read through that type, those programs that do emphasize those kinds of things. Um, there, the issue is that, um, and what some have raised more recently, is um, there are times at which some of those syllable types and syllable division rules can be um, less um, less consistent to be helpful. Um, sometimes spelling rules can be like the same same kind of thing. Um, I do, I wanna make clear that there, I think is a lot of value in teaching students about what a syllable is as they're going to read multisyllabic words, teaching them a rule that is very, very frequent and very, very consistent. And that is every syllable has at least one vowel. Um, that is a basis for a, a lot of the, the syllable types of um, or syllable based approaches to reading multisyllabic words. Um, 
where I think, you know, what's unclear and where we need some more evidence is um, knowing what the value is around asking students to identify what a type of syllable it is, if it's open or closed, or, or really what, com what it comes down to is, are they able to read that syllable correctly? Are they able to read the syllables separately and then blend things back together to read that multisyllabic word accurately as a whole unit? Um, so, uh, so that's kind of where we're coming from with, with that approach. It gets, it, again, it's one of those places where research isn't clear, but it is a problem if people say that we have to be doing something, right? If we have to be teaching these rules, then, um, then that becomes an overstep from, from the evidence. Another point, too, that, um, that I hope readers can, you know, pick up on in the future um, is, you know, really kind of thinking about... Uh, models like connectionism and the ideas around these ideas that, uh, you know, Mark Seidenberg has written about quite a bit. Uh, Barb Foreman has written about this in that context, is that um, this idea that rule-like behavior emerges um, from instruction that doesn't necessarily teach rules, right? It teaches kids how to decode. It teaches how to learn the alphabetic code. It gives them feedback all the time in their responses. Rule-like behavior emerges from instruction that actually isn't asking them to memorize rules. And so I think it's an interesting point to, to consider. Yeah, I, um, Judy, did you wanna ask anything or comment about yeah. that? No, it'd be nice to comment. I mean, like when I went into my OG training, I'll be honest, uh, it was a little overboard even for me. Like they were drawing all the bridges and stuff and I haven't really been drawing a lot of those bridges and so forth. And, you know, I do love, syllables i love marking and i've thought of ways to mm -hmm. mark words in mm -hmm. a way that's more meaningful like you know prompting kids okay let's draw the breath what sound does the vowel make but i think like one of the biggest shifts for me is realizing that you know when i would look at the data there would consistently be some kids in each classroom that was still struggling even with strong uh instruction on syllable types and Mm -hmm. application. So mm -hmm. I think one of the things that, you know, Faith opened my mind to is, um, and it's something I knew before, but I didn't think as carefully about it, is vowel flexibility. I think that mm -hmm. very often in a lot of programs, we don't really um, teach kids how to be flexible with vowels quick enough. Mm -hmm. And kids, for some reason, think that vowels only make short sounds for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And it becomes almost habitual in their mind to mm -hmm. initially or instantly just make that short sound. So what I've been playing with in the field with my own teachers and with myself when I'm working with kids is um, teaching instead of all, well, I still teach the syllable types, but I also really put a lot of emphasis on the breath or the brief. Sometimes I, I Googled, you could say it both ways, where uh, vowels make a short sound and then also making a macron where the vowel makes a long sound. And I've even used that as a scaffold, like in text, when I'm reading with a kid and they quickly forget which sound the vowel makes. Sometimes I'll just draw that symbol instead of saying, oh, did you know it's a close syllable? And quickly they'll be able to be flexible with the vowel. And just all of a sudden it really starts to click. Like instead of going into, oh, this is a silent E. Yes, they see it's a silent E, but I quickly made that symbol. It's not interrupting the discussion so much. It's not affecting meaning. And that little simple scaffold has really like helped it click. So I think for me, yes, syllabication was very important for me. As a reading recovery teacher, I didn't really know how words worked as well as I wish I did. And my knowledge of really knowing how words work well it actually didn't come from my letters training. It actually came from reading uh, Wiley Blevins' book, A Fresh Look at, at Phonics. It mm -hmm. was like two pages where he broke down the code and I was like, wow, this is such powerful information. Mm -hmm. Let me see how I can help kids understand that information because now I understand how to teach decoding better. So I think my attachment to the syllable types was also about me as a, as a teacher and understanding orthographic mapping more carefully. And now that I had that knowledge, I felt like I could instruct kids so much better because we used to prompt kids in reading recovery. Do you see a part that you know? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the kid did and maybe the kid didn't. But it's so much more powerful when you're talking to a kid and saying, okay, you just learned something in phonics. 
Do you see a vowel team in there? You know what sound that vowel team makes. E. Let's slide through the word. T e. Mm. So I think even my language and how I prompt kids became more, su you know, um, successful. So I think for me, it's been a journey and it's been an important part of my journey. But you know what? Your example that you just gave, Judy, yeah. um, with the EA. So let's say they tried one and it didn't work. You could always say, you know, try the other, you know, try that. It's the idea of being flexible. That Correct. Always right. One way. And, and you know, it's funny that you say that, Faith, because now I've actually been modeling that flexibility with kids. Like even when I modeled the lesson in the classroom today, I modeled that thought process that you just said, because I think that's an important part of explicit teaching in general is being able to model how your brain problem solves out loud. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that that's great. And, and what you're doing there is you're building the foundation for that term set for variability that I referred to earlier. Um, that, that recognition that sometimes we're going to have to adjust the pronunciation. Uh, it's especially important in English because English is a semi-transparent semi orthography in which we do have a good bit of irregularity. What you mentioned, Judy, about um, flexible vowels is absolutely important, you know, because as you know, most of, in some cases, um, word irregularity comes from the vowel doing something different. And so when kids can be, can recognize that, um, you know, the pronunciation doesn't quite sound right. It doesn't sound right for the sentence. It doesn't fit in a word in your oral vocabulary. Look at the vowel and try that alternate sound, you know. Or as the teacher or skilled reader next to that student say, just jump in in this case, say, in this case, OU says, ooh, right? Um, try it that way. And um, that idea that we need to be flexible um, and adjust is, is critical to reading proficiency in English. So Nathan, two more points and then we'll wrap up, okay? Because... Okay. I could talk to you. I know Judy can talk to you for hours, but we want to respect your time. That's okay. And, Thank you. Uh, it's, you know, it's a great conversation. So two more points. Mm -hmm. I want to talk one about phonemic awareness in the dark uh -huh. and two speech to print. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's do quickly um, the phonemic awareness in the dark, because I know that you're passionate about having um, teachers connect letters immediately rather than do isolated uh, phonemic awareness in the dark type of things, unless they're in pre-K, you know, early on. But um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but can you Talk a little bit about that because we've had episodes, Judy and I have had episodes about this. And I know as someone who came out of reading first as um, a, a coach, a regional coach, that we were taught always that phonemic awareness developed from connecting letters and sounds. And somehow along the way, um, you know, in the last number of years, it became like everything had to be about this oral only phonemic awareness. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, a point we make in the, the paper is this 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 phrase, uh, phonemic awareness is something that you do in the dark, or you do with your eyes closed. Um, that is true, right? We accomplish phonemic awareness tasks without looking at print. You know, you can say, what sounds do you hear in cat? And I can say k at without looking at the word cat. I can engage in phonemic awareness tasks. The point about that phrase was that it was used to describe the concept. Um, it was used to describe the concept to people that hadn't heard of it before um, and indicating how it's a, it's a skill that we use from in, in the oral language space, essentially. Um, it was never meant as a phrase to suggest that, that we should teach it that way. Um, I think that that phrase became adopted by uh, program developers in some situations. I think that coupled with the misperceptions that we alluded to in the article around what people think this, the National Reading Panel said, this idea about the five big ideas or the five pillars of reading that people often suggest that the National Reading Panel concluded. Um, so 
I know I know we don't have time to get into that one, but this this idea that there are these five pillars, um, and one of them being phonemic awareness, um, and you'll see it all over the internet. The five pillars of reading, the five big ideas. This is what we should be teaching, or this is what a reading lesson should should involve. Phonemic awareness being one of them. As schools see this and say, okay, we need something for phonemic awareness. Publishers now seeing what the market wants says, okay, we got something for you. Here's a phonemic awareness program. Oh, but you should be doing it in the dark. Remember, it, phonemic awareness doesn't involve letters, which are all kind of these misperceptions and, and oversteps. Um, I certainly believe that you uh, can and should do oral phonemic awareness activities before kids have learned the alphabet, before they've learned letter sounds. Um, we can be playing speech games with kids in pre-K, even kindergarten, as kids are learning to connect letters with sounds. We can practice uh, at the phoneme level, them isolate individual sounds and words, to take words apart by the individual sounds, to take individual sounds and blend them back together to form words. Those segmentation, those blending skills are going to be essential for them in learning to read and spell. But as they are learning to connect print with sound, now we're merging those things. Um, when you're doing good phonics instruction, you are inherently involving phonemic awareness. If you are teaching them explicitly to sound out words and blend them back together to read as whole units, when you're teaching them to spell words that are spoken and doing it explicitly, you are naturally teaching them phonemic awareness through segmentation and blending in a way that shows how sounds work in words. Um, we can do other activities like uh, word ladders or word chains, the things you do with pocket charts and letter cards. We, we spell out a word, we sound it out, we blend it back together. We demonstrate how we can change one letter in that word, swap, swap, I mean, we build cat, we swap C out for B, sound it out again. Now we're doing phoneme replacement, phoneme substitution, but doing it in the context of, of, um, of print. Uh, there is a good bit of evidence indicating that when you combine, when you integrate, when you are naturally doing good phonics instruction that naturally integrates, the inherently involves phonemic awareness, that reading outcomes are stronger. So, um, you know, another thing too is that phonemic awareness is developing in sophistication as kids are learning to read. We don't have to be targeting phonemic awareness to a certain point in order for kids to be ready. Right, that these things, as kids are learning to read, then the whole system is kind of being interdependent and developing together. Um, so that's the big point there around um, around phonemic awareness is um, integration with print and dispelling this notion that we have to separate phonemic awareness instruction from phonics instruction. That's simply, I think, counterproductive. Um, and then the other question you had, Faith, was about. Um, the oh, speech to print and uh, print to speech. So uh, I think this is more is relatively newer where um, we're seeing <clears throat> more and more emphasis and um, uh, ideas that, that instruction needs to follow a uh, speech to print uh, notion in order to be consistent with the science of reading. Um, and in support of speech to print instruction, sometimes you'll see recommendations on building sound walls. Basically what this is referring to is this idea that um, Kids are coming in already with access to all the speech sounds in, you know, in language that will ultimately be represented by letters. Um, that this idea of, of targeting a phoneme and then teaching the different letters in which that, that phoneme can be represented <clears throat> and then doing a lot of activity with spelling and working with those sounds in that way. <clears throat> the, the idea that that's better than a print to speech idea of the idea of starting with the letter M for example and saying it says the sound mm, okay, then moving on to the next letter and so on. Um, I think there's value in both. Like Sharon and I point out at the end of that section that we should probably be doing elements of both perspectives. Um, the science of reading does not say that one should be done over another. <clears throat> in fact, no studies have ever compared a print to speech versus a speech to print um, approach to instruction. That has never been directly compared in an, in an experiment. Um, absolutely integrate spelling activities with decoding that, be, that should be happening all the time um, and in in doing that kids are interacting with words and interacting with orthography in a different way they're hearing the sounds segmenting a spoken word and matching those sounds with with letters and letter combinations um, so again I don't go too far in thinking that the science of reading says speech to print or print to speech that's simply not the case I think elements of both are important. 
So, Judy, um, do you have any questions, any thoughts, anything that we didn't cover that was a burning question on your mind? All right. So two things. Um, I uh, wrote it in the chat. I don't know if you guys saw. Have we updated the past ascent assessment to align with the new research? Because I know a lot of teachers depend on that assessment and it has a lot of really advanced phonemic awareness skills. So have we updated that assessment? Do we continue to use it as is? And then uh, Faith and I also did an episode on sound walls and um, the use of pictures with the mouths. I think that we were directed that that could be cognitive overload for many students. However, in a lot of the teacher guidance that were being given in the field, I still see a million mouths and pictures. So there still seems to be uh, misconceptions or miscommunication going on with that. So yep. question one, past assessment, are we aligning it now to align with the research or keep going as is? And the mouths on sound walls, and then that's it. And Nathan's been an absolute blast. His uh, article that was written with your teammate, well, it, it was just, it spoke to me more than any article in a long time. I think this was a home Thank run. You. I hope it goes viral after this episode. We'll uh, share it in our show notes. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that a lot of teachers in the field and researchers and educators and administrators, this is a good one. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll make sure to pass that along to Sharon too. So yeah, um, did you want me to comment on those those comments, Judy? Yeah, um, the past, I'm not sure. Um, that's, uh, I think you're referring to, is it Dave Kilpatrick's um, past assessment? Um, I'm not sure what he's has going on with that. Um, I just don't know. Um, then uh, around, um, oh my goodness, the second question. Um, can you remind me? Judy, so you asked about the, oh, the mouths on the sound walls. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Sound yes, thank you. are all the rage right now. Big, big, big districts are coming in to see teachers. Mm -hmm. People are scrambling to try to figure out um, the whole sound wall thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not against sound walls, certainly. I, I think they can be a good support. I just don't, I think there's, there's a challenge, I think, in teaching a five-year-old um, all the different ways that EA can be the, the, the E sound can be represented, right? I, I think there's there's something we do as as adults, as skilled readers, um, where I think we we think that 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 speech to print should work in this way that makes sense to it. But I'm not sure that's operating that way for a five year old. I, I think having the letter first, I, I think can can reduce cognitive um, cognitive load significantly and and help a lot by having a concrete reference and then attaching the sound to it. But again, I, I think there could be support with sound walls. And now around the idea around mouth pictures and mouth movements. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm not up on it enough, but I think there is, there's always value in seeing someone make a sound, right? And, and a, a teacher referring to their mouth and lip and tongue movements as they're producing a sound, I think that can be very helpful early on because we as human beings, we learn through multiple sources of information. Hearing it and seeing it at the same time can be helpful. Um, the images I think can be challenging because you're not seeing it move, right? It's hard to know what that, those mouth movements look like and happen through a static image. Um, whether that's, that, that's distracting or in, increasing cognitive load too much for children, I'm not quite sure. Um, it, it seems like, you know, maybe it should be, I don't know, I don't wanna speak too far out of, of, of bounds, but um, it doesn't seem particularly problematic for me. Um, it could be another reference that some kids latch onto in, in recognizing sounds and helping them produce them. Um, I think better is demonstrating in real time for students what those uh, how those sounds are made and produced so i i just want to comment on something so you had said something about starting with the sound and then showing the different letter combinations that could um, be the spellings for those sounds and you mentioned for a kindergartner but when kids are just starting out in a speech to print approach they start out with one-to-one -one correspondence. They don't start out with all those variations. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, trained in speech to print. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing it for a long time. 
Um, and I don't want to get into that. That's not the purpose of this mm -hmm. discussion. This is really about the idea that there is no evidence that says one approach is mm -hmm. better than the other. I think that's what we want to leave people with. It's really about teaching something well. Mm -hmm. I see the benefit of speech to print and have used it. And I think it's a very efficient way of getting kids up and going. But since there is no evidence to show one is better than the other, I think people out there have to stop trying to make it sound like one is better than the other because we really don't know. We right. don't have the evidence. And that's what I want to leave us with as far as this show goes. I think that should be the main idea of this show tonight is please, if there is evidence for something, let's stick to the evidence. And if we don't know yet, let's just say we don't know mm -hmm. and that there needs to be further exploration yeah. of this topic. So I want to wrap up. As Judy said, you've been an absolute delight. Your article is excellent. I hope it gets a, a, you know widely widely read. And um, I hope we have you back again because this was fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Faith and Judy. Yeah, I think what you said is exactly right. And, and I'll, I'll add to that. If, if we don't know, look for what key elements are there. Does it involve kids reading a lot? And then, like you said earlier, Judy, what do your data say, right? What, what do your data say in terms of reading acquisition and student success? Um, and if you're not seeing results, then think about what we need to do differently or think about how that program is being implemented. Uh, but thank you, everybody. This, is, this has been really fun. Thanks. Mm -hmm. This was great. Oh, Judy, you want to help us how to get yeah. In two seconds, follow us on Facebook. Join our Facebook group, The Real Teachers Letting Loose. All right, we got a lot of people. Also, theliteracyview.com, that's your opportunity to contact Faith and I. That's your opportunity for researchers to say, hey, we want to present research on your show. That's your place to say, hey, we want to donate to The Literacy View because we like what you're doing and we know podcasting costs money. And also, you could now advertise with the Literacy View. And you don't have to be advertising education. Maybe you have a spa or Disney or what else, Faith? Barnes and Nobles. Where are you? Anyway, we're hoping we're making a difference. Share and subscribe to our episodes. And the biggest gift you could do is share with your colleagues, friends, administrators. And hopefully, we're changing lives one view at a time. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys.